American trains are a joke. Amtrak services have been severely disrupted. Slow, late, expensive. It makes you wonder where does the money go? Extremely limited service. Look at this map. Hold on, something's missing. Boom! This is America's freight rail system. Bigger than China, bigger than Russia. We all know America's passenger rail got a lot of, let's say, deserving hate. But its freight system is top tier. America's freight rail is the best anywhere on Earth. But it didn't always look like this. By the 1970s, both Europe and the US freight system were losing market share. Freight railroads were in disrepair and struggling to stay afloat. So, to find out how American freight trains went from boom to bust to boom again, I studied train history, visited the world's largest rail yard in the middle of Nebraska, and uncovered a key government decision made about four decades ago by an unexpected hero that saved the freight train industry. Here we are. In this video, I'm going to do two things. First, prove that America's freight trains are the best in the world. And second, show how counterintuitively less competition, not more, can sometimes make an entire industry stronger. Okay, so you might be thinking, America is falling behind. There is no way that American freight train is better than China or Russia or even Europe. Well, I'll prove it to you. There is no better place to see the might of American freight than here. North Platte, Nebraska, the largest rail yard in the world. 140 trains come through here every day. That's over 14,000 cars. 17 tracks come in, 16 tracks go out. To service America, they run this yard 24-7, 365 days of the year. Goods come across the country. We're talking automobiles, steel, coal, wheat, grain, corn. Nothing, says Nebraska, more than corn and trains. This yard connects trains to the larger system of tracks strewn across the US. And that physical scale is the first reason why American freight is the best in the world. The U.S. boasts about 92,000 miles of track. That's more than Russia and more than China. More tracks means the U.S. railroads can reach more customers directly, from the Midwest grain silos to Texas oil refineries to California ports. It gives them the ability to reroute around bottlenecks when weather or congestion strikes. And it allows corridors to specialize in regions, coal in Wyoming, containers in the coasts, and automobiles in Michigan. In short, more track miles translate into lower costs and more reliable service. That is economies of scale in action. Still not convinced? Okay, then let's talk about reason number two, the length. Take a look at this. A European train averages around 2,400 feet long. Or China, where even the super long trains top out around 6,500 feet. American trains are much longer. This train took about two and a half minutes to pass me along the Humboldt River in the Nevada desert. I'll save you the math problem. At 50 miles an hour, that works out to two miles. <laughs> the typical American freight train stretches about one mile, 5,300 feet. Some of the longest can stretch up to three miles, the length of 750 elephants lined up trunk to tail. This is capital intensity. One crew hauling twice the cargo, burning less fuel per ton. It is why U.S. trains are the longest and heaviest in the world, and no major system comes close. In terms of total tonnage, U.S., Russia, and China tower over the rest of the world. Now, the U.S.'s relative performance is impressive. Russia has nearly twice as much land, and China has four times our population. One issue for China is ballooning debt. The State Railway Group is carrying nearly a trillion dollars in debt by servicing ghost trains out to the boonies. Russian railways are old and antiquated. The US big class one railroads, companies making over a billion dollars a year, reinvest around $27 billion annually of their own money back into track, locomotives, and new technology. Putting these three reasons together, the verdict is hard to escape. American freight rail really does sit at the top. But hold on, 
America's freight trains used to be a mess. And what saved them broke one of the most fundamental rules you think you may know about economics. Let me explain. By the 1970s, decades of outdated regulations collided with new competition from trucks, highways, and planes that was crippling rail. And yes, if you watched my videos before, you know I want trucks to be bigger. But why not both? What was once the backbone of American commerce was now limping along one decrepit mile of track at a time. So by the 1980s, the government decided something had to be done. And there were two options. Hey Dynamos, it's time to tell you about this episode's sponsor, Framer. Loyal watchers of Business Explains the World will know that Framer is a no-code website building tool. It helps you launch any website in days, and you don't have to be a developer or designer to use it. Today I'm going to show you another one of their AI tools, AI Translate. With AI Translate, you can localize your site so it appears in other languages at the click of a button. Do you know the next most popular language for Business Explains the World viewers after English? German! So let's translate our site for our German viewers. We click the globe here and add German as our locale. Then we click Translate and it translates the page. Then let's go back to the page, change the language, and you can see the page in German. Wunderbar! Are you ready to build a site that looks hand-coded without hiring a developer? Launch your site for free at framer.link slash dynamo and use Dynamo 2025 for a free month of Framer Pro. Thank you, Framer. Now let's get back to freight trains. Okay, so like I said, there were two options to save freight trains in America. The government could continue to nationalize the railroads, like it did with Penn Central, taking full ownership of the industry, or it can go the complete opposite way and deregulate the whole thing. It chose deregulation. So, quiz time! Which 80s president do you think did it? Carter, Reagan, or Bush? Uh, nope. Uh, nope. It was Jimmy Carter, a liberal democratic president. Surprised? Jimmy Carter was actually a pragmatic deregulation proponent. He already did the airlines in 1978 and pushed similar reforms in trucking. He even deregulated beer. The microbrewery industry <laughs> thanks Jimmy. And in 1980, at the end of his term, he signed the Staggers Act and deregulated railroads. And this is when the boom began. We're also cutting away the regulatory thicket that has grown up around us and giving our competitive free enterprise system a chance to grow up in its place. So let's walk through how deregulation flipped the script on American freight rail. First, they cut loose more than 100,000 miles of unprofitable track. Railroads could finally stop pouring money into these ghost lines and focus on busy corridors that actually made sense. Second, with that freedom came profits. Investment returns jumped from a pathetic 2% in the 1970s to nearly 9% by the late 80s. That margin let railroads do something they had not been able to do in decades. Reinvest in their trains, their tracks, and new technology. The result was an investment bonanza. Within a decade, productivity doubled. Better maintenance meant far fewer accidents. And third, deregulation opened the door to mergers. In 1980, there were 33 Class I railroads. Today, there's only seven. Now that sounds backwards, right? Fewer companies usually means less competition and higher prices. But here's the surprise. Even though the industry got smaller in number, the prices didn't go up. They went down! Average freight rates adjusted for inflation dropped by more than 40%. Shippers got more of the stuff they like, safer reliable service at lower costs, less of what they don't like, like delays and service fees. But now, in 2025, the consolidation story might not even be over. Union Pacific, which operates Bailey Yard in much of the West, and Norfolk Southern, which runs lines up and down the East Coast, are pushing to merge. If approved, this would create the first truly transcontinental railroad company in US history. And as you've seen with the mergers after deregulation, bigger networks could mean fewer handoffs, faster shipments, and even lower costs. See how slow they're moving over there? The engineer brings the train into the yard to move engines from track to track. Now, they have to do it here because this is a central hub for the network. But imagine another rail yard where the only reason they're slowing down is to switch companies. A bigger network means less switching costs, lowering prices for the rest of us. 
And if Union Pacific and Norfolk Southern succeed, it would almost certainly trigger BNSF and CSX to do some kind of merger as well. But wait, are we really sure this is a good thing? Four companies would now control nearly the entire national rail network. This is kind of sounding like a cartel in everything but name. Well, I know it's counterintuitive to everything you've been taught about competition, but there is an economic logic for why fewer competitors can actually make some systems work better. Follow me here. Conventional wisdom dictates that consolidated competition is bad and monopolies are evil. But what if, in this case, they weren't? Economists have a name for it. A Bertrand duopoly. It's a weird case where you only need two firms for prices to drop to competitive levels. It was coined by a debate between these two 19th century French mathematicians, Antoine Augustin Cournot and Joseph Louis Francois Bertrand. On one side of the debate was Cournot. His model found that a duopoly, two firms, is only a little bit better than a monopoly, and that more firms always gets us a lower price. On the other side, there's Bertrand. Bertrand criticized Cournot's model, claiming that it had no solution. His argument centered around the question, why would two firms stop lowering their price to compete against each other? Think about two street vendors trying to sell you their mangoes. You walk up to the booths. If one vendor offers you one for $3, the other one knows you'll buy theirs for $2.99. Buyers pick the cheaper one. The result? Each firm has a constant urge to undercut the other by a penny, but that can't go on forever. So they undercut each other until the price equals the cost of doing business. Bertrand duopolies only need two firms to get to the competitive price. In the years since, economists have largely sided with Cournot. The more firms, the better, but not always. For Bertrand duopolies, two conditions must be met. First, the products have to be nearly identical. If you're a shipper, you don't care what the logo is on the locomotives, you just need the freight delivered, and you will pick whoever offers the better rate. Second, each firm has to be big enough to serve the whole market. Today, every major US railroad operates a massive network that can cover huge chunks of the country. That means any two of them can compete head to head across thousands of miles. And here's the kicker. Railroads have enormous fixed costs in tracks, yards, and locomotives. But once they're in place, the bigger the network, the cheaper it is to move each ton of freight. That is why fewer, larger corporations can sometimes make the system more efficient, not less. Research found that when Union Pacific entered Wyoming's Powder River Basin to ship coal and compete with BNSF, the rates competed all the way down to cost a decade later. It's a case where bigger can actually mean efficiency gains lead to the lowest price with just two firms. Now, there's nothing sacrosanct about regulations. Sometimes we need more rules, and sometimes we need better rules, and other times the old rules become antiquated and gotta go before they freeze an industry. Rail freight wasn't guaranteed to come back. The Staggers Act worked. US rail freight recovered while Europe's continued to lose market share. Now, deregulation still does not leave a totally unregulated Wild West. While many places have this direct Bertrand competition from two firms with parallel tracks, some towns only have one. We call these captured lines. This is where government still steps in, requiring an existing line to rent out their tracks to a competitor. This is called right of way. Roughly 20% of current traffic is regulated. And we've seen Bertrand competition work in other industries too. Uber and Lyft have very little profits despite there being only two of them. Cell phone networks have only three major players, Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. Yet over the years, cell service has continued to improve and real prices drop. The urgency for rail to consolidate is coming from its biggest competitor, trucking. Autonomous trucks are no longer science fiction. Walmart is already using them with Gaddock in Arkansas and Kansas. Aurora is running driverless long-haul routes between Dallas and Houston, and more are on the way. Automation will cut trucking's biggest expense, labor. One driver for one trailer. For trains, the labor savings are already smaller. Two people can already haul seven, eight, or even 10,000 feet of freight. So rail will need other ways to keep driving costs down. Larger, continent-spanning networks may be part of that future. American Freight Rail went from bankrupt and broken in the 1970s to become the most efficient, most profitable, and most impressive freight system in the world. That is no small comeback. 
And now, I know what you're thinking. Could American Passenger Rail make a comeback too? Well, unfortunately, that's another saga entirely. Let us know if you want us to make that video next. There's a lot of land in Nebraska. <laughs> do it again, do it again, do it again. Should I wink? Is it working, the winking, or is it super? Say, okay.